thank you for uh, inviting me and thank you Vera again for this beautiful surrounding and city of Vienna. Uh, okay, so I have to start uh, uh, this, uh, this day talking. I hope that my talk will not be too rough, uh, too rough start for you <laughs> because uh, it could get technical at some points. Anyhow, uh, the title that I have chosen uh, might already uh, give you an indication of uh, where I come from. Uh, it is writing and price. Uh, why price? Because it's price as in pricing, because what I specialize in, uh, I'm a practitioner actually, not, not an academic. Uh, so I've created a company in which I'm still involved today, uh, which deals with the pricing algorithms and software of derivatives. And we apply uh, methods uh, and, me and methodologies that are almost 40 years old now after uh, in 1973 there was a breakthrough uh, with uh, Black-Scholes formula, so we use those. Uh, so my company specializes in doing this, and it's a very specialist uh, industry. So the algorithms are complicated, and I'll, I hope that I will explain uh, later. And before that, I used to be myself a market maker or trader on, in the open outcry markets, uh, dealing with options. So I've also known price and the markets from the field. So I was myself... Uh, buying and selling options in an open outcry uh, for, for 10 years. Uh, now, why writing is that because after a, a long story of thinking and developing software and thinking about what I was developing uh, from all points of view, not only computational but also metaphysical, I came to the conclusion uh, that the pricing process that goes in the market as a temporal process should not be confused or identified with a, with a stochastic process or a probability process, as you, as you learn in probability theory. It is what I call a writing process. And why the word writing? Because when we say writing, it is more serious. It's when you say writing history. So when, whenever there is a process where not only random variables go up or down, but whole world views change, such as history progress. This is where I think I propose the word writing, meaning to mean in a massive sense of the term, because writing is serious. So I will try to actually today show you that the price, as it will appear to you through uh, the technology of derivatives, is not to be lodged in the category of probability theory, stochastic theory, stochastic processes, but in something which I myself name a writing process, and I hope that I will can uh, uh, show you the contrast between writing and price in that sense. Now, also writing because um, this whole thinking uh, about the underlying metaphysics uh, drove me to actually writing a, a couple of books uh, about it. So uh, eight years ago, I wrote a first book, and this is the last one which I, I was published uh, last year. So for the last eight, eight years, I've been more of a writer than a trader or uh, a developer of algorithms, even though people in my company are still developing a very cutting edge algorithm uh, in the field of finance. So that's the last book. The previous book that I uh, published uh, was called The Blank Swan, The End of Probability was the subtitle. Which, which is where I really denounce the fact that probability should not apply to the technology of derivatives. And for three years, there was an outcry in my field, people uh, like me, like people dealing with the technology of derivatives, what we call quants in, in my field, uh, discussing with me, attacking me on forums, uh, trying to tell me what metaphysics and philosophy, especially philosophy as in Deleuze or Meyesu, has got to do with finance. Uh, so that, that went on for four years of fierce debates, and I ended up uh, writing the second book uh, after putting together all the, um, uh, uh, the new arguments. However, the second book took me, if you will, one level even deeper in the thinking. So in this, in this book here, I engage now about, I engage even with the foundation of uh, probability theory per, per se, and this is why the, the purpose of my talk here today is to try to show that price, as I understand it, is not, don't think about it as you know, the ordinary price of something trading in the market and we don't know what the market is, but I think of it as a logic that is alternative to the logic of probability. So price to me has to do with the deep categories and the schemas of thought, and I'll try to show that probability theory 
as it was axiomatized by Kolmogorov and as it is today, uh, you know, it's a huge corpus of, of theories, etc., corresponds to a certain schema of thought, to a certain schema of thinking about the world. And I do insist that the two logic uh, that I want to oppose are material logic, not formal logics. Why I call them material? Because probability has to do not with uh, formalism only, but with the concrete world. So probability has to be linked to the concrete world, but because even though it's axiomatic and it's mathematically now a completely respectable science, because probability used to be an applied science and it used to be despised by mathematicians, but after it was axiomatized, it became a very respectable formal science. However, there is still in it something which is mysterious and which I will try to actually uh, show you today, which is how matter or the concrete words enter into the formalism. So that's why I call it a material logic. And it is in that hinge, precisely, how matter enters in thought with respect to the schema of thought of probability, that I will look for an alternative that will turn out to be price and the pricing process and derivatives. <clears throat> now, I will keep talking about the market uh, as, I, as I speak. Uh, just a reminder here and like a, a kind of a declaration of principle. Uh, the market, again, to me, is not like the uh, sociological market that you can think of where stuff is just being traded in, in the marketplace uh, chaotically. F what I understand by a market is something which is already layered and structured by the derivatives. So let me uh, try to formulate this because this is important. What I call the market is the following. I already assume that I have a certain financial asset which is trading freely in the market. So I kind of already assume the notion of the market first, but bear with me one second. So I have a financial asset which is trading in the market freely. Think of a, like the, 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 the rate of exchange between dollar or euros or, or, or equity index like the S&P. So it is trading perfectly randomly. And the beauty of the thing is that when you have a market like that, you have to forget about fundamental value. There are no value in this, there's only price. And by that, I mean that it is what Keynes have, has called the beauty contest. So in that sense, the price of the thing is not, does not correspond at what people think is the value of the, of the asset or the fundamental value of the company that is trading, but what you think the price in the future is going to be according to the consensus of other people thinking what the price is going to be. So that, this kind of self-reference, you can show that it leads to complete randomness being the uh, consequence of that. And this is what scares a lot of people uh, who don't want to go into this field of finance because they, they are scared by the idea that something as soon as it is traded freely in the market, and I mean freely traded, traded every second, like I used to trade stuff on the financial exchange, not to mention that today algorithmic trading trades even in the millisecond. So the difficult point to, uh, to accept is that it is going to be completely random. Therefore, there is no value because it's completely random. Price is the randomness. But what happens now is that once financial theory conceptualizes this fact, the consequence of it becomes volatility. So volatility of the price becomes the certainty you are, uh, of the thing. So value is not certain, there is no value, there is only price which is uncertain and random, but the volatility of the price, so I'm going up one level, becomes the value of the market, if you will. So that becomes like what the concept of the market be is. And the miracle that happens with, the, with derivatives is that once you conceptualize the fact that volatility becomes now the fundamental value of the market, this, thanks to the Black-Scholes formula, which was discovered in 73, gives me the value of something which is the derivative written on that underlying stock. So you see the paradox here. I'm saying there is no value, there is only price, but then I end up with the conclusion that volatility is the only value, and this, at the second level, gives me the valuation of a derivative, and the algorithms that we develop in my company, the books that I've studied, etc., are all about how to value, in the sense of really the deterministic value of the derivative, and it's now at this second level that my definition of the market enters. And I say, no, if you want to believe that the market is the alpha and the omega, the derivative has in turn to become traded as well. So it has in turn to become a traded asset with price and no values. You see what I mean? So I, to, to me, the market is always at the iteration between n and n plus one. Something is trading. I, I did use volatility as like a value or something which becomes transcendent and we believe that we can do theory and etc. Then I have valuation again. 
and everybody is happy. And everybody stops there, by the way. In all the textbooks of finance, everyone is happy with the conclusion that derivatives are valued. And there is no theory of hap what happens next, which is the purpose of the exercise, now that the derivatives are going to be traded and we are going to be back to that category of price, which is, I say, more serious than valuation, what happens next? So that my whole investigation is how I fall back from value to price. Okay? I, I, I think, in a sense, I've already said everything that, <laughs> that I'm going to talk about now. So uh, the, the rest of the talk is only filling in the details, if, if, if you will. <laughs> okay. So also, uh, I will try to, to, to make this a little bit entertaining by considering two cases of writing, not only uh, the market of contingent claims. So contingent claim is another word for derivative, because the derivative is derivative on something else, meaning the payoff of the derivative will depend on what the underlying uh, stock is. That's why another name for it is contingent claim, because it's contingent upon something happening to it. Contingent claim as opposed to a claim that pays a certain and an, an assured payoff. So a contingent claim is another word for derivative. So as I said, the market of contingent claims is a case of writing. Why? Because contingent claims, as I said, follow a price process which is more serious than probability, which I call the writing process. And on top of that, derivatives themselves, the financial contracts, are written pieces of paper. So that's very important for me. Uh, because probability theory and algorithmic uh, thinking about probability is abstract because it's only wiring out states of the world and applying probabilities to them, whereas derivatives are material pieces of paper on which the scenarios are materially written, and instead of running a computer to, 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 to evaluate them, you exchange them materially in the market. So to me, the written character on a piece of paper is very important materially to say that the only way that an algorithm is going to compute the price of the derivative is not an algorithm, it's the market itself which is the ultimate algorithm. Uh, which is going to materially exchange it. And the other case of writing, which I always uh, like to cite, is the case of Pierre Ménard, author of the Quichotte. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Uh, uh, Pierre Ménard is a fictional character uh, which was uh, created by Borges uh, in 1939. Uh, Pierre Ménard is a writer, so that's why obviously he enters into my category. And Pierre Ménard uh, uh, has died and a friend of his uh, which has uh, entertained correspondence with Pierre Menard during the last 20 years of the life of Pierre Menard, is telling us the story of Pierre Menard. And he's telling us that through correspondence with Pierre Menard, apart from two or three pieces that Pierre Menard has published, uh, which are like a poem or something like that, and he, he was not a very well-known writer. He lived in Nîmes in the uh, 1920s. So apart from a few items that he published not very well known. By far the most important work of Pierre Menard, according to the narrator, is an unpublished work which took him 20 years, to, to not even to achieve because he did not complete it, is to write two chapters of Cervantes' Don Quixote, mm -hmm. chapter 9 and 38. So he took two, 20 years of his life to really write word by word in Spanish, even though he is French, uh, two chapters of Don Quixote, not copying it, obviously, because to copy it would take uh, one night or two nights, but write it. And this is very mysterious. Uh, you wonder how that could be, but if you read the story of Borges, it is so realistically written that you believe that actually Pierre Menard has done something. He has, he has actually uh, achieved a kind of exploration that took him 20 years of his life to end up producing the Quixote. And it's not that he wasn't aware of the Quixote either. It's not that he didn't know of the existence of the Quixote and somehow magically God or Cervantes has spoken in his dream. No, he knew perfectly well the Quixote. So when you try to compare these two things and to wonder where does the um, uh, writing process of Pierre Menard take place, obviously in my sense it wouldn't take place in probability or prediction because in the state of mind where this is thinkable and programmable and algorithmic, Pierre Menard would be copying the Don Quixote because in the algorithm there is definitely a state of the world where the Quixote exists. So it's not in prevision or in algorithmic thinking, it's, it's something else. And to me, that something else is what I use also differentially to talk about writing. So to me, writing is when it's not in uh, uh, prediction, it's in that other uh, area. And Terminar to me becomes the Typical writer. So Cervantes is not the author of the Quixote. Cervantes has written something which turned out to be the Quixote by chance, whereas Pierre Menard has written the Quixote 
So he is even a more original writer than, than Cervantes. <clears throat> so the, what, what I'm uh, saying here really that this writing process that I want to think about and to differentiate from uh, probability, I even have to think of it outside the time of prediction. So to go back to my two cases, so when the market, as I talked about earlier, the market in the sense of always going from n to n plus one in the derivative, when the market is defined as the endless writing chain of contingent claims, because bear in mind that and as soon as I have one derivative, which is trades, I can then write another derivative on it. So there is an endless chain here. The time of prediction and of algorithmic trading uh, drops out of the equation. So that's my whole point. So the market in that sense of the writing process is outside the provision time or the algorithmic time of prediction. And also for Pierre Menard, if Pierre Menard were writing the Quichotte in time, meaning in time, in chronological time, where it's definitely wired in his past that the Don Quichotte exists, he would be copying it. But we know that he's not because we believe that he's done something mysterious. We don't know what yet. So it, he is also writing outside time. <clears throat> and so uh, I have a, a, a one of my amazing uh, results is that therefore the derivatives market, as I understand it, which again is to be contrasted to the algorithmic view of prediction, is a technology for writing the future, not for predicting it. So uh, <laughs> again, why? Because the future is too serious to be predicted. So it has to be, to be dealt with with a technology which, has, which is material technology, which is massive in that sense. And to me, that's my, my point, uh, because that's my specialty. I argue that the derivatives market is to be inscribed in such a massive technology and not in algorithmic uh, view. So, of course, you've all guessed that I'm completely against algorithmic trading. Uh, so, I, I can algorithmic trading, according to me, even though it works locally, but from the uh, global point of view, it's doomed to fail because uh, you can show that as soon as an algorithm has been programmed and it's a black box, you don't know what, but you assume that it is running some statistical kind of analysis, even very short term uh, period of time and trying to guess the next tick, so you can show mathematically that if it is relying on some kind of algorithmic statistical uh, inference algorithm, it, it is as if it is evaluating a certain derivative and stopping there. Whereas, not, not, not forget my, my, my postulate and postulate that the, the value of the derivative is going to be contradicted by the price of the derivative. So in other words, if that derivative that the algorithmic trading is implicitly evaluating exists, it should be contradicted by the market, therefore he will not be able to actually arbitrage the price of the derivative, therefore he will be dominated in the, in the, in the sense of game theory by somebody else who's trading that derivative, so therefore it's going to fail. Well, anyway, this is technical. <coughs> uh, and I also like to um, uh, cite this other case uh, where writing is contrasted uh, with time. Uh, this is actually a citation by Maurice Blanchot, uh, who you may be familiar with, who is a literary critic, uh, French literary critic. And Maurice Blanchot has written a book which was also very important in, my, in, my, uh, in my, uh, the history of my reading and my writing. And the book by Blanchot is called The Book to Come. And there is a last chapter in that book, which is also uh, entitled The Book to Come, in which chapter uh, Blanchot commands the poem a, a Throw of the Dice of Mallarmé. And Blanchot says, Malarmé's, you know Malarmé's uh, poem, The Throw of a Dice. Uh, yeah, the Malarmé's poem is a very unusual poem because this is where at the, at the end of the life of Malarmé, where he was already starting to be annoyed by the fact that uh, verse and the meter of poem has become completely free and kind of random. So he wanted to also write in a free verse. However, as the story goes, he wanted to produce a poem in a free verse kind of thing. However, he did not want to choose a particular meter. He wanted at the same time, even though he's going to throw the dice and produce a certain instance of that uh, meter, he wanted still chance not to be abolished. He wanted all the possible other contingent uh, variations of meters to be present in his poem. And that's why he resorted to this um, uh, uh, kind of um, way of delivering the poem, which you have a poem where the, the words are laid out completely on the page, so there is no linear order. You write the, the page and you have blanks between the words, etc. And uh, Blanchot is commenting here by saying, Malarmé is a throw of the dice, 
is the book to come. Space excludes ordinary time. And this space, the actual space of the book, and it, in, that, in, that, uh, in that instance, it is the poem, instant never follows instant according to the linear progression of an irreversible future. So here Blanchot is speaking against the vision of time and prediction where you have time steps in which words follow words. Because Mallarmé has resorted to space where the words are over, all over the page, this allows uh, uh, the, the meter, or if you will, the, 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 the generation of the words of the wall not to be uh, consumed by one algorithm, but you have all kinds of algorithms at the same time. So, to me, that speaks for the fact that there is a layering uh, in, 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 the, um, uh, in, the, in the probability. I, do, I don't want to have one view of time where only you have one process going on up and down, but a layering as in a book. And this is why I can show you here how time and space uh, get uh, contrasted in my picture. So that is here uh, <clears throat> the point of view of time, which I'm going, which I'm actually criticizing. Time, which is fed up into the algorithmic trading, and where all you have to do is for the algorithm to predict the next step of evolution of the price of something. So that's only one dimensional because I'm looking in the time dimension. As opposed to, and this is like this is here the most popular uh, process uh, that we know uh, in finance and everywhere, which is Brownian motion. And I mean, of course, you're familiar with these kinds of graphs. I mean, it's exactly uh, how uh, stock evolutions look like. So that would be the time dimension. And people, a lot of people, really think that the market is all, all only down to this. So typically, this would be the, the price chart of an index, say, of the equity index. Whereas I oppose this view, which is very narrow, to the space view, which is this, which is uh, actually uh, the, the domain in which I specialize. And this here, what, what is this? This is a snapshot, so there is no time dimension. In it. This is taken at one instant. In that case, it is on May 5th, 2014. The picture that I showed you earlier was the picture of the time evolution of the euro stocks, which is the equity index, uh, European equity index. However, here it's the snapshot of the thousands, actually 1,200 options that are trading on their equity index as seen at, at that instant. And all the blue lines that you see are market quotes, bid and ask. So we have a bid and ask, meaning a selling price and a, a, a bidding price that market makers, and I used to be one of those guys, are producing for you instantly on the uh, floor, in this case, uh, I mean, it is uh, in the case of the S&P, it could be Chicago, four derivatives written on that underlying. The reason I'm showing this is that if you believed, for instance, that the algorithmic view of Brownian motion that I showed you earlier was the correct one, according to which there is only one parameter, which is volatility, which describes everything, this picture would be completely flat. Whereas the reality is that every option and the options here are, uh, are um, uh, distinguished by their maturities and by, by their strike price. Every option is seeing a different volatility than its neighbor. That's why they are lying at a different level, even though the underlying is the same for everyone. So it's as if every option is seeing the world and the future differently than its neighbor. And that's why, to me, it's like a book. So every page of the book is, is at a different level uh, than its neighbor. So how to make sense of the fact that you have this kind of layering of options is what is driving me to the fact to, uh, of, of this, this whole argument about uh, saying that definitely the market, when you augment it with the derivatives, is, a different, is a diff in a different dimension uh, than algorithmic uh, trading and then the algorithmic view. So this is another view of, of the same thing. And this here, our volatility uh, index option. So as I said, in the market, it's not only the case where options are written on an, on an underlying equity index like the ones I've showed you. When options, as in the picture as I showed you before, start becoming traded independently of each other, themselves they become basic assets and you have on top of those options written on them. So now in Chicago, for instance, you have not only options trading, 
but options on the options and what you call volatility index options. So that's the other layer uh, on top of that. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So my whole, my whole purpose, I, I suppose, is to uh, actually argue that because of the fact that you should never look in the market only through the eye of one asset that is trading, but always wonder what the derivatives written on that asset are doing. And as I said, virtually any asset that is trading will have to carry with it all the derivatives that are written on it on top of one of each other. So in that case, my whole argument is to say that the market becomes as massively unpredictable and untotalizable as the future. So it's not algorithmic trading, it's something else. And so this is the word massivity here, which becomes my key word. And also, to go back to, to Pierre Menard, uh, the, what, what, what I find fascinating in Pierre Menard is also there is a sense of infinity and massivity in Pierre, Menard, in Pierre Menard because even though you feel that there is, it's trivial and Pierre Menard is only replicating the work of, of Cervantes, so therefore there is only the one and the same, which is the copy, Pierre Menard is in correspondence has told his friend at the end of his life, which he could not actually complete the, uh, the work because I said he only wrote two chapters. He said, the task uh, that I have undertaken is not in essence difficult, if I, could, if I could just be immortal, I could do it. So why there's the sense of infinity in Penmenar, which, by the way, explains that it took him 20 years to do that. It, it, it's very strange because you feel that if what Pierre Menard is doing, meaning trying to write something which is already written, then everything becomes possible in a way. Even though he is replicating some existing work, as soon as you think, no, I have in my thinking to change the logic and no longer to uh, see this as, as replicating algorithmically a work, in which case he would be copying it, as soon as you, as you think, no, he's doing something else, then the whole logic of uh, copy and, uh, and model becomes uh, in fault and everything becomes possible. So it's as if Borges, according to me, was showing us in Pierre Menard a, a picture of the word inverted. Because it's as if even though Pierre Menard is going to converge to the one work which he wants to deliver, which is the Quichotte, but actually the word that he is exploring behind him is massively infinite and it would take him infinity really to come back from this word to produce uh, that work. Okay, <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> what I'll spend the last uh, half hour trying to, to do is to talk a little bit <clears throat> about abstract uh, probability theory. Uh, and as I said, my, this is my, my last kind of research because I want on the one hand to argue that price and the writing process and the derivatives and the market is something uh, which is alternative uh, uh, to probability at a, at a very uh, deep level, which is actually the level of foundation of probability. Uh, and the conclusion that I will um, uh, arrive at in the end is that abstract probability theory, which I'll try uh, briefly uh, to, to show to you, and as I said earlier, what interests me in it is that it is a formalism, but in this formalism, there is the concrete word that enters because probability has to connect with the concrete word. And the concrete word is something which is material, therefore it has to resist formalizing. It's very difficult in formal theory to say that I am in this particular situation. In formalism, you only have situations which are possible situations. So situations which, which, are, which are part of a set how to distinguish the particular situation that I'm in, the indexical, if you will, the situation, this situation and not another one, a, situ a situation which, of course, can be different than it is because it is contingent. This, I think, there's a major difficulty in this, and probability theory has to, to express it. This is what I call the massive contingency of the actual world. So probability theory is trying from the massive contingency of the actual world to uh, represent uh, probable events, etc. And I'll show you how. And on the other hand, there is the massive contingency of the future, which 
also is beyond probability theory because, as I told you, the future is massive and should not be re reducible uh, to uh, stochastic processes. So what I'm just <coughs> we want to do here, and it's like a work in process, so you have to bear with me, is to try to give you my reading of abstract probability theory, which is at the basis of everything that we are doing in finance, so at the basis of the theory of stochastic processes and at the basis of the algorithm that we have to price derivatives. So I'll try to uh, talk about the foundation of that and try to show you what, according to me, is the major point of difficulty, which, if we look at an alternative way of, of seeing it, we might end up with an alternative logic, which is the logic of price. So the two things that I'm going to contrast is abstract probability theory uh, that I will try to, uh, to, uh, to explain to you. And then how from that, as I said, an alternative would be no longer uh, a theory, but a technology and no longer abstract probability, but pricing. Okay. <clears throat> so what is the main difficulty in abstract probability theory and why is it called abstract, by the way? It's because we have always, if you want to model a probabilistic uh, process, for instance, th throwing a dice, you have to begin with a concrete situation. So the concrete situation is, I am throwing the dice. However, the main point is that the situation, which is co the concrete situation, I have to take a point of view of the situation and abstract the situation. For instance, if I'm playing dice, the only thing that interests me is the numbers that will show up. I'm not interested if in every time I throw the dice to wonder whether it's raining or not, or there's a cloud in the sky or not, or if I'm smiling or not, because the concrete situation as it is, you can, there's an endless ways, what I call the situation in its absolute concreteness. There's an endless ways that you can describe it. So there is no end to the level of detail of describing the concrete situation. However, probability theory, in order to make it work, has to take an abstraction of that and take a point of view and only retain a certain characteristic of the concrete situation and not treating, treat it in its concrete, in absolute concreteness. <clears throat> uh, you, you see what I mean? So, so that takes us here to, to a major distinction that is at the, at the uh, at the founding level of, uh, of uh, probability theory, because it's only, it's only to um, uh, the abstraction of the situation that I'm going to, uh, that I can assign probability to. So it's not, if I have, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm playing dice and uh, the situation is the whole world as it is unfolding, in, uh, in the, the throw of the dice, I will not be able to assign a probability of that instance of the word, what I call the case, what is the case, the sample. If you, if you think of the word as a, a kind of random generator, which is generating samples of the word for me. And as I said, there is no end to the level of details in which you can describe the samples. So you cannot in probability assign probability to that uh, sample, you only can assign probability to an aggregate of samples. So in other words, the two situations uh, that are um, different in all senses, except that, that they will, the two, of the, the two of them will lead to the event of the six coming up when I throw the die. Uh, I, these <clears throat> Yeah. When you throw the dice in quantum mechanics, you have a possibility space, everything is possible. Now we think that the dice will appear. Mm -hmm. There is also a possibility that the dice might not appear, they are gone. But we do not assign any probability to this case. We just assign probability to the case, you throw the dice and the dice show a number. Yeah? I think this is very comparable to, to this what you are uh, presenting. 
uh, what I'm, I mean, what I'm trying to uh, articulate here is the fact that uh, <clears throat> you cannot assign probability to anything. You have to assign probability to something that you can combine in events. Uh, I'll try to pick up from something which may be familiar to everyone, more intuitive, uh, and which is actually uh, the reason why probability uh, is so fascinating uh, and why everyone uh, is trying to, uh, to think hard about probability and why there is such a thing as a philosophy of probability, by the way. Uh, and that uh, thing is the law of large numbers. Uh, so the law of large numbers is the empirical, if you will, uh, finding that if you are throwing a coin uh, repeatedly, uh, keeping in mind that the, each trial is independent, so there is no influence from the previous one on the, on the current one, so you are repeating the trial in exactly the same conditions as before, uh, but there is no influence, and you are throwing the coin repeatedly, Empirically, you observe that in the long run, uh, the frequency of appearance or he of heads <coughs> or tails converges to, to a limit, uh, which is one half if, uh, if, the, if the coin is, uh, is fair. Uh, it's the same with the die. If you are throwing the die uh, repeatedly, the dice, uh, you observe uh, in the long run that the frequency of appearance of each of the faces of the die, if the die is not loaded, uh, is one, one six. So that phenomena uh, is called uh, the law of large numbers, which means that in the limit, when the number of trials increases, uh, frequencies of appearance of certain events have to converge to something. And this, by the way, uh, this, this, this law, I mean, even there are people who've tested it in the past centuries and have actually thrown the dice uh, uh, thousands of times to really um, uh, uh, demonstrate the fact that there is a convergence of the, fre of the frequency um, is the defining uh, characteristic uh, of, of probability because there are even people who think that the whole concept of, of probability which is, uh, which is abstract because if you are holding a coin and if I tell you that the probability of, it landing, of its landing head is one half Intuitively, everyone un understands more or less uh, what I mean by that. So if you think about it a minute, what do I mean by it even before uh, throwing the coin? It must mean the law of large numbers. It must mean that should I throw the coin uh, an infinite uh, number of times, then it's not going to fall on heads all the time, of course, or, 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 or on, the, or, or on uh, tails. It's going to, to, to fall in a random uh, fashion. And... To say that the probability is one half, I must be mean to say that in the limit it will converge to, uh, uh, to one half. So, so that, that is important because people have tried to show uh, that law. People are not sure whether the law of large numbers is a law of nature or is a law of logic or is a law of physics. Uh, and this is actually what uh, has, uh, in my sense, um, uh, started the whole, um, uh, even axiomatization of, uh, of, of, probability, uh, of probability theory. <clears throat> uh, you, you have two versions of the... You have two versions of, uh, of, uh, of the weak law of, of large numbers, uh, of the law of large numbers. The weak law of large numbers is finitistic, meaning it only considers a finite uh, number of trials. And the statement of the law is that if uh, I tell you that the probability of heads is one half, what does it mean in terms of the law of large numbers? It means that if I consider a certain uh, number of, of trials, if I, if I throw the die sufficiently uh, often, there will be a number of trials above which the frequency of appearance of heads will only deviate 
uh, from one half by a certain tolerance uh, that I can uh, predefine. But, so it means, in other words, that the, pro the, the, the probabilities are going to, to converge, right? So you take, you take a certain finite uh, number of, uh, of, uh, of different sequences of throws, and within this population of different sequences of, let's say, thousands of throws, only a fraction of that population will uh, show a frequency of appearance of heads different from one half uh, with a certain tolerance that you pre-specified. So that's a finitistic statement. But actually, more interesting is the strong glow of, of large numbers, which really takes care of what happens in infinity. Because you all feel that if probability is to be a metaphysical precise concept, such, as, such that metaphysician can tell you that the probability of half is something which resides inside the coin, if you will, immediately you think that this has to relate to infinity, because why stop at the uh, thousand uh, throw, why stop at the million throw? It has to be infinite. So here you have a kind of duality, which I find fasc fascinating, between the fact that we are looking at something material, and let's not forget that the die or the coin is something material, and it's materially that I want to inscribe the, the probability of one half for the coin or one six for the faces of the, of the die, of the, of the die. So it's material in that sense, yet to really understand what it means that I should be talking about objectively or materially there being a probability of one half or one six, what I find fascinated is, fascinating is that you should then in mind or in thought throw the die infinitely. So the strong glow of large numbers is the one that says if you throw it infinitely, often, which of course it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thought experiment because no, no one uh, can, can, uh, can throw it infinitely, then the frequency will converge to a probability with certainty. So that is uh, the, the interesting thing, which actually have um, uh, led uh, philosophers, for instance, to identify the concept of probability with the concept of frequency in the infinite limit. Okay? So the real challenge, the real challenge, is to show the strong uh, law of large of large numbers, and because it's a situation where it is very intuitive what we are talking about, because we are looking at the die that is in my hand, I'm looking at the coin, so I feel that it's something material and something that I, I want to say intuitively. Only when, whenever I open my mouth to try to say it, I have to go to infinity. So it's so it is intuitive, and at the same time you feel that there will be a difficulty in trying to show it, because in mathematics you have to be dealing then with infinite quantities, and in mathematics, I mean, it's tricky uh, always to deal with infinite quantities and to deal with an uh, infinite uh, number of trials, okay? So that, uh, to me, was really the point which, according to my rereading, if you will, is one of the brilliant and major consequences of the axiomatization of probability theory that Kolmogorov achieved in 1933. Because before him, the first one to show the weak law of large number was Bernoulli. Bernoulli was able with very simple algebra to show that uh, if you stop at a certain uh, number of trials, then the frequencies will more or less converge with a certain tolerance. However, no one was able to show the strong law of large numbers uh, until uh, Kolmogorov uh, came up with the full axiomatization of probability theory, which I was in the, in the process of showing you with this distinction between sample and event. Uh, Emile Borel produced a proof in 1909 before Kolmogorov, but the proof was not uh, very rigorous. I mean, it was very uh, controversial because all the results that he shown was correct, but only the, the proofs were wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the reason why, uh, to go back to what I was saying at the beginning of, of the talk, when I said that to me, a probability is a material logic. Uh, the, the point that ultimately I want to drive at is to say it's that as soon as finally in mathematics you have a theory which is fully mathematically consistent, 
Probability used to be despised by mathematicians because it used to be applied math, but now it became a full mathematical theory. So it's, it's a formalism. It's a formalism that you can think about completely, consistently, both uh, logically and even uh, metaphysically and, and, uh, and philosophically, I believe. However, the distinguishing feature of it, as I said at the beginning, is that matter, the concrete situation, the concrete world, enters into it. That's, for instance, what makes all the difference between probability theory and analysis, analyse in, in, in French, which is the study of functions and uh, variables and functions of variables, etc. And you find that all the people, uh, at least in the French uh, uh, school, uh, in the beginning of the, of, the, of, the, of the 20th century, who produced all the major results in probability, were all trained in analysis, not, not in probability. Because analysis was the respectable field and probability uh, was not. Why? Because probability has this kind of hybrid nature in it where you have the concrete word in it and you have uh, something. And by the way, all the results that mathematically dealing with infinities that you show in probability theory have their equivalent in analysis in the theory of function uh, and, and variables because it's integration theory. However, probability has this notion of sample space, which I tried earlier to, to convey to you, in excess uh, of uh, analyse uh, uh, and mathematics. And it is this that Kolmogorov, uh, according to my reading, say, uh, managed to put in the axioms uh, of, probability, of probability theory. Okay? <clears throat> and the reason why I'm talking about, about this, because to me, the introduction of the sample space the introduction of the fact that I have two levels, I cannot deal only with the out, with the uh, with the with the uh, with the outcomes, with the uh, the faces of the die. I have to put under it the fact that the material die uh, enters. Uh, this uh, is what, to me, shows the hinge between. Two infinities, the infinities that you have to th think of uh, in the formalism to go to infinity in order to show the result, and the infinity which is to me resides in the fact that matter enters uh, into the formalism. So, so to me the fascinating thing is that as soon as you put in the formalism something new which is the concrete sample or the concrete word, this to me produces the infinity already. The concrete situation where, for instance, as I said, I'm throwing the die even once, even before I go into the process of throwing it an infinity of times, even when I consider once the die, to me there is already the infinity contained in it, because as I said, there is no limit to how, what is the level of detail of describing the, uh, uh, the, concrete, uh, the concrete situation. Uh, but by the way, as I said, because going to infinity is, is, a, is a thought experiment, if, if you think about it uh, for a second, you feel as if the law of large number is something that you want to prove uh, physically. But at the same time, you are requiring that every time, in actual physical time, every time you throw the die, you require that the condition of experience be exactly the same as before. You don't want the next time to throw the die opposite to the wind, say, because you know that in that case, the game is no longer fair. Uh, you will be biasing the probabilities. So there is a kind of paradox because you know that you want exactly to reproduce the same conditions, the same physical conditions as the previous throw. But then I ask, what is the limit? If you really want to produce the exact same conditions, then you should also have the same results. So how come that the conditions are completely the same except at the last limit, you want the possibility of the die uh, falling uh, on heads or tails. So, of course, you have people who would discuss for you forever by saying, well, uh, microscopically, the surface of the table is not going to be the same and the force of the wind is not going to be the same. So, people will have a tendency to explain back the randomness by physical uh, explanations. Where I, where I say that, no, this is only... Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter because in that case somebody will still be able to imagine a thought experiment where all the conditions are exactly the same 
the table, the wind, etc. And yet, if I want to explore uh, something which can be heads or tails, I want all of that to be the same except uh, for the last part. So that's why, if I want to read this purely metaphysically, in the sense of reading in the law of large numbers, what I said, the fascinating link between matter and formalism, I would tend to say that, no, it's not a physic physical experiment. It is a thought experiment, because I have to take it into infinity and it's completely ideal and completely uh, perfect. However, it's a thought experiment which involves matter. That's the important thing. So it's not a thought experiment in the formal sense of formal thinking. It, it, in it, it involves matter. And if I want to take it as, as pure and as metaphysical that, as I wish, what, what is the, the aspect of matter that we are exploring here is simply the fact that, so as I said, don't think about throwing the die infinitely because anyway, it's a thought experiment. And as soon as you look at the die already in thinking, the whole process to infinity is already present there. So in that sense, the intuition of the infinite number of trials, as I said, has to be already part of what I'm looking at, at the die, even the die which is not yet thrown, but not the die as a formal variable. So I'm not thinking of, the, of a die as a formal mathematical variable which has different values. There is on top of analysis and mathematical analysis, the fact that the die is a material object and therefore what is the material distinguishing feature of it is that it is lying on, on this face and not on the other face. It's lying on the table. So it's showing a face, but it could have shown the other face, meaning it's contingency. It is this face, but it could have been different. That's the definition of contingency. So th that's why even by looking at it as that, lying on the table, you already have the infinity of trials that I'm thinking of. Nobody would think about trialing the die if the die is hanging in the air. If the die is hanging in the air and it's showing you all the possibilities of diff different values, this would be analysis. It won't be probability theory. This would be as if I'm looking at a mapping between six cases and six different values of the faces. I have put matter on it, and matter makes the, the die land on the ground for probability theory to enter into the game and for me to start something which is no longer a variable. It's no longer I'm surveying in thought the different vari variables of, of the die. It becomes something which is a trial. So I have to lift the die to, to, to throw it. You, you see what I mean? So to me, the fact that it's landing on the, on, the, on the table. And this is an image, of course. So think about it as the fact that I'm saying that the situation is this and not otherwise. The concrete situation, the sample, is this and not otherwise. However, there are infinitely many ways that I could, I could change the situation, hence contingency. But the fact that there is a situation which is driving all this, this is the uh, uh, major difference that probability theory is bringing to the general uh, notion of mappings and functions and variables. So that's why the omega, the omega is what is the case. That the omega is the concrete situation I'm in, which is in the present instance producing materially only in a way that the concrete world can produce it to me. It's pro con concretely producing to me the current situation. And this, as I said, because it's concrete, there is I, there is a limitless ways that I can find it, that I, I can describe it, because I have to set up a limit. Where does the, the concrete situation stop? So it's as if the word big omega is, is, is the sample space. That's if you think of it as the word. However, because it opens behind my back, I don't need to tell you where I place the limit and the level of details that I can describe. Think of Pierre Menard here. I mean, there are infinite, infinite, infinitely many details. So I, I, I place it behind my back. That's, that's why, funnily enough, in probability theory, the sample space omega in all the textbook, you find they call it an abstract space. Mm -hmm. I find this ironic because this, this is supposed to be the concrete world. Yet in mathematics, they call it an abstract space. What does it mean, abstract space? Meaning in mathematics, they don't want to tell you what's inside it. So it's an abstraction. 
meaning ultimately you can potentially put in it whatever you need later in order to make the experiment more, more and more um, uh, uh, precise. Uh, so, and it's an abstraction, so all you need to know at the beginning of the axiomatization of probability theory is two things, is that I will only care in that concrete situation, which is, as I said, potentially infinite, I will only care about the point of view that interests me in the, in the current game. So in the current game of dice, the concrete situation with, as I said, potentially involves the temperature of the air, the sun, everything, the world, the astronomy, everything. All of that, I only care about the weather in that instance of the case that the world is going to produce for me. For me. All I care about is whether it will land the phase six or five uh, or, or, or four. So that means that I'm, as, I'm abstracting on top of that situation in order to create the events. So the events are what is thinkable. The concrete sample, I call it unthinkable. And why I call it that? Because another way of looking at the, uh, at the logic of the event is to say that the event is an answer to a question. So if you are able to formulate a question, meaning what is the number that was shown? Was the number odd or not? Uh, at, as soon as you can formulate something under the form of a question, meaning you, you can think of it, then you create an event for it that probability theory can put probability on and measure. But the concrete situation in all its infinity, if you, if you think about it in an absolute infinity, is unthinkable. Okay? Yet, the formalism has to articulate the two. The formalism has to tell you that if two concrete situations are different in infinitely many respects, but are behind my back, I don't want even to look at them, yet lead to the same number, which is six. Therefore, the, 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 I mean, the, the, say, the saying in probability theory is that the two situations contribute to the event six. And in mathematical formalism, you then say that the omega one, which represents situation number one, and omega two, which represents situation number two, belong to the same set, which is the event. So the events in probability theory are abstractions over all the samples that the world produces for me, meaning there are sets composed of samples. So it's only aggregates of cases that I can measure in probability theory. I cannot measure the case. So the case in itself, which is what the concrete world is producing for me, I cannot put probability on it. Why? Because I cannot even think it. Potentially, it's infinite. It's only I have to take a point of view, therefore, to impose a certain logic. Therefore, I become also a slave to my point of view. Because remember what I said earlier, that maybe events will happen which make change the whole point of view and change the whole world view even. So that's why probability theory is kind of a victim to its own abstraction. So it has to abstract uh, from the concrete world uh, in order to be able then to run the algebra of events. So algebra of events meaning you can combine events. You can say, I have event A and event B. I can uh, assign probabilities to them. That on that also, I can assign probabilities to the product of the two events, meaning the two happening at the same time, etc. So there is a, an algebra. So whatever thought has to take care of something, the thought has to be able to produce this algebra. Uh, so in order to do that, I have to go to that level where I uh, group the, uh, the concrete samples uh, into, into events. <clears throat> so to go back to, uh, as I said, the, um, the um, heart of probability theory, and it was the, 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 um, the axiomatization by Kolmogorov was deemed successful when finally he was able to prove formally and rigorously the strong law of large numbers, because as I told you, that was the main challenge. And you, you will see that how historically it, it, turned, it unfolded. You will see how this notion of distinguishing these two levels, the concrete level, the sample space, and the event space, which is the space where I can assign probability and do uh, algebra, this duality was crucial. Why? Because before Kolmogorov uh, uh, produced his uh, axiomatization in 1933, uh, there was a first attempt 
at formalizing probability uh, by Richard von Mises in 1919. And probability, to formalize probability was a big challenge, actually, uh, which Hilbert in, in 1900 posed to the community of mathematicians, because everyone was feeling that probability was more and more used in all kinds of applied sciences, etc., but still lacking uh, mathematical respectability and still lacking a mathematical foundation. So that was an open challenge. So von Mises one, one, was one first um, uh, attempt uh, at doing so. And remember, I told you that the strong law of large number was, as opposed to analysis and mathematics, the main characteristic feature of probability, up to a point that von Mises even chose the strong law of large numbers as a defining uh, characteristic of probability. So instead, von Mises, instead of saying, I will postulate probability, uh, like Kolmogorov would do later, and assume that probability is just, the, you know, this concept, this abstract concept that I will axiomatize in terms of sample space and event space, and then, as Kolmogorov did later, show the strong law of large numbers. Von Mises did the opposite. He said, I don't know what this probability, because probability is a metaphysical concept, uh, and the people were challenged to really uh, know what probability, but I know something, because von Mises was an engineer, so he's were, he was pretty much attracted to the real world and to the concrete application. What I know for sure is that if I produce the infinite numbers of trials, even if producing them infinitely is an ideal situation, but yet, he says concretely, let's suppose that I can uh, produce them infinitely, I know that the frequencies will converge. This is the mystery. I don't know if it's a law of nature or whatnot. I don't care. I will take that as a fact, and it's from that that I will uh, define probability. So von Mises actually uh, starts with something he calls a collective. So he starts with the fact that all of us agree that a coin is being thrown an infinite number of times. Everyone agrees that it is random, therefore heads and tails are going to appear uh, randomly in time. And everyone agrees, or at least the von Mises system requires, that the frequency of appearance of ones and zero will converge to the limit. What does this mean? It means that if you count how many over the 100 trials, how many times the one has appeared, it's like 40% of the times, and you continue to infinity, this proportion has to ultimately converge to a fixed value. And therefore, the, the frequency of zero will be uh, one minus uh, that value. So von Mises starts with this as a given, and he said, this is the situation, and from that I define probability as being this limit, the limit of the frequency. Uh, but then he ran out into a problem, and this will take me into, uh, I have five minutes? To, yeah. This will take me into the next slide of why uh, he ran out of the uh, problem and, and Kolmogorov uh, finally gave him uh, the answer. He ran out into the problem where because von Mises wants to start out with the concrete word, so he wants to start out with the actual outcome that the word of von Mises has produced for him as far as the sequence is, is, is concerned. And by the way, the whole sequence, even though it takes place in time, is one case. The beauty of the, of the if you will, of the sample space is that it's so abstract that even if I'm throwing the die infinitely. It's not every time that I throw it that I have a different sample. I can immediately consider that if God is looking at the, at the word from a timeless perspective, if you will, the whole infinite sequence is one outcome of the whole world. Okay? So, so von Mises starts out with the full concrete sequence. So he's imagining concretely that I have ones and zeros. And he requires two things, as I said, that the frequency converges, so it, it doesn't oscillate forever, so if, in the limit, you have 50% say of ones and 50% of zero, and second, he requires something which is called the axiom of randomness, because he doesn't want to have any sequence. If you have any sequence like a periodic sequence, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, forever, 
then obviously there would be a, a limiting frequency, which is one half, but everyone would agree with him that it's not, this is cheating because this is not random. So he wanted both things. He wanted some regularity in the limit, which is the frequency converges, but he also wanted some irregularity, otherwise we would be cheating. So he, there, there was some tension in his system because he wanted to define a way formally, because we are talking here about formalizing probability, that even though in thought I imagine that in the limit the frequency converges to a fixed number, which is one half or 40%, etc., yet I require that the, there is no pattern, no recognizable pattern in the ones and the zeros. So to formalize that was very tough, and he did it. He did not succeed formally of doing it in his first version of, of the theory, uh, somebody later showed uh, that, uh, that that was possible. So, um, uh, what he required in order that the sequence be random is a very clever thing. He said that, imagine the sequence is given concretely in mind, right? I require from you that you should not be able to extract a subsequence from it, where the frequency is different from the one that I had before. In other words, if you are throwing the, the coin repeatedly and the frequency is converging to one half, to ensure that the sequence is really random, meaning produced by a real coin which is really random and not produced by an algorithm that is simulating a coin, you have to make sure that there is no way that an algorithm could predict based on what happened in the past, what the next bit would be. Because if he could predict, then he would extract the bit, or at least choose the bits on which to bet, on which to bet money, if you are betting even money against the coin. If you are, you are able to choose a subsequence, meaning every time the coin is flipped, you have you don't bet, you refrain from betting, and you only bet when the algorithm tells you that you should bet, it means that your algorithm tells you that if you bet only on those specific instances that I tell you, the overall frequency that you will be observing will be on that subsequence will be different from the overall. Therefore, you will make money against the opponent, the casino that is paying you even money. If you would be able to do that, then it's not good. Then the sequence is not random. For the sequence to be random in von Mises' sense, no algorithm should be able to extract a subsequence where the frequency of occurrence of the ones of the zeros is different from, from one half. So, it, so it, is, it is a very, I mean, only in mathematics can you imagine sub, such abstract ways of thinking, keeping in mind that with what von Mises we are with the concrete sequence, paradoxically speaking, yet he is asking me completely abstractly to figure out that the sequence of ones and zero is such that I cannot find a pattern in it, so you wonder, does such sequences exist? I mean, how can you imagine them? In mathematics, a guy proved later in the 30s that yes, not only do they exist, if you imagine all the, sequ all the infinite sequences that are uh, zeros and ones. In mathematics, this is a very known uh, space. It's, it is, you know, zero and one to the power uh, infinity. So in mathematics, I can very well give myself in thought all the sequences of zeros and ones. You can ask the questions, do it, in that huge set, do, do they actually, are there actually sequences that verify what von Mises wanted, meaning such that I could not, reading the sequence bit after bit, predict the next one? The answer was, yes, there are. So, so, so von Mises was vindicated because it would be, have been a, 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 a tragedy if, the, if the such sequences didn't exist, exist. Not only there are sequences like that, but there are a lot of them. Actually, the, the, the majority of sequences that you can imagine generated with 1 and 0 to infinity are like, uh, are completely random. So that, that, that's a completely non-intuitive result, which you can only get in mathematics, which, by the way, is telling us that this sequence I cannot construct it. 
So you, you, can, you cannot build an algorithm to generate such a sequence because if you are building an algorithm, the algorithm itself would be, would, can, would, can predict it and therefore you can use it to make money out of it. So, so here we're entering really in that uh, realm where uh, you can think abstractly, mathematically about infinities and get results which are very non-intuitive, meaning such sequences, even though you cannot even imagine them and you cannot run your thought constructively on them, not only do they exist, but they exist in huge numbers and they fill completely uh, the space. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so von Mises was vindicated when, 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 when he, he found that, but later his theory was criticized because it turns out that the space of sequences that he was thus uh, describing did not actually fill exactly the requirements that you should want a random sequence to, to verify. So in other words, it turned out that the randomness that von Mises wanted the sequence to verify was not actually completely random in the sense that later was formalized by Kolmogorov. So with hindsight, if you will, when later Kolmogorov finally managed to show the strong law of large numbers and, and, and he used for it the concept of random variable where he uh, deals with the sample space and the event space, it turns out, according to that theory, which is today the, uh, the, the theory of probability, that the sequences that were produced by von Mises were not completely random, meaning it turns out that you could actually devise betting strategies that you could make money infinitely uh, out of them. Okay? So von Mises failed in uh, uh, founding probability on his concept of concrete random sequence because of that. And it's finally uh, Kolmogorov, who from the beginning took the opposite uh, direction. Because, if you will, von Mises' mistake was to start with the concrete sequence. As I told you, probability theory cannot deal with the concrete sequence as such. It can only deal with the event space with aggregate of sequences. So what von Mises was trying to do when he said that I have my, my concrete sequence, however, I don't want it to, I don't want you to extract from it subsequences such that you could bet at a different uh, ratio than the one I'm offering. Actually, without telling it openly, he was exploring a space where those sequences could vary with some probability. However, he did not have the means to measure that space because he, he did not yet define probability. So it's only when you have the full power of only here uh, dealing, applying probability to full sets of sequences and not individual sequence uh, like, uh, like Kolmogorov, to full sets of sequence, was Kolmogorov able to show that the number of sequences, the number of sequences on which the strong law of large numbers is verified is huge and have, ha, has, has measure uh, one. Okay. So let me uh, then uh, finish with, with that uh, thing that I started uh, alluding to earlier. So again, to, 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 to wrap up uh, the, the thing, I'm fascinated by the fact that as soon as probability enters and as soon as you need to put matter into the formalism and to speak about the probabilities of things that the concrete world is producing to me, I need to go to infinity. And as I said, for the formalism, if I'm looking at the, at the die which is sitting on the table, the formalism can only deal with functions and variables. To try to lift the die once in the formalism is as hard as lifting it and throwing it in infinity of times. So, because it's, it's a thought experiment. So as soon as I look at the die, it doesn't, even if I look at the die as it sits on the table, already I have, uh, I have the infinity. And as I said, my explanation of why as soon as the concrete world and probability and the interplay between the sample space and the event space 
enters. The reason why I can only think things infinitely and I can only uh, uh, show the strong law of large numbers by using uh, the, the infinity of set theory of mathematics is that according to me, there is already infinity in the thing which is the unthinkable thing, which is the presence of the sample that the concrete world is telling me is the case. Okay. So uh, there was a last part which uh, apparently I, I, I don't have uh, time to, to cover, which is to say that coming to that conclusion, you see how probability theory acts backwards. Probability theory, whenever there is something new that happens, that ruins its makeup, whenever there is an event that changes the space of events of it, it will tell you, yes, that event was actually part of the sample space that was behind my back, which is completely implicit. I did not see it. And then now I can reformulate the whole problem and make that event a new part of the algebra of event. So it's always reasoning backwards. It's always throwing any radically new event back in the black box of the sample space by telling you, yes, that event, even though I had no representation for it thinkably, but because it was unthinkable before it occurs, but by the way, it was, has always been part of the sample space because the sample space is unthinkable anyway. Now that it has emerged, I can think it and put it in the space of events and start applying probability to it. So it's always backwards probability theory. Whereas what we require in order to address the open future is something that dispenses completely with this notion of black box and sample space, starts with something which has no infinity behind it and put the infinity ahead. So this shift, putting the infinity ahead, starting with something where the event and the sample space are the same, and it's not that the depth of the one is always driving me backwards. So starting with something where the sample space and the event space are the same, and the infinity from which the future in all its massiveness is going to emerge is forward rather than backwards, this according to me happens in the logic of finance where uh, and this is what would be my last statement, where the word that I will be talking about is not the concrete word that everyone uh, think about, would be the trading pits where financial assets are trading. So the word as I used to know it as a trader. So my word was only reduced to the trading pit. But because I'm modest, of course, I'm going to show you that moving infinity forward can at least work uh, in the world which is reduced to the trading pit. And the whole idea is to say, that we no longer look backwards, but with the prices of derivatives that are trading in the market, the infinity of the concrete world is thrown ahead of me, and therefore I'm genuinely open to a reading of the future in the sense of the massive reading, which I call writing rather than uh, prediction. Okay, thank you. I think okay. that's a very good place to, to stop because we could obviously talk about this more but I think perhaps this is something we will pick up this afternoon. Um, obviously we're working towards creating different kinds of critiques, different kinds of languages, different kinds of writing, different forms of literacy, ones that are adequate to speak to the data that we're working with. And so to think quite deeply about these issues is incredibly important. Um, I think um, we have a lunch break scheduled. Do, do we want to? Do we want to have some, a few questions though um, to start with? And we'll, we'll still. I mean, I know there's a lot to think about here, but come back. But uh, perhaps we can take a few questions um, to pick up and quiz Ellie while he's in. He's in full flight. <laughs> Before I land on the... Before you land. <laughs> in the future. Or, or crash. He's in the future. We need to destroy. Maybe I should put back the... Yes? Yes? About randomness? Yeah. If I could, sorry, talk about... More about randomness. What do you mean by randomness and uh, 
to the yesterday just touched the uh, absolute randomness and yeah. each has different meanings. It had different meanings yesterday. Yeah. So I mean. Uh, uh, so here, for instance, uh, the randomness that I showed you, which the whole debate of the strong law of large numbers and the debate between von Mises and Kolmogorov was, were all about, was simple randomness in the sense that it was down to flipping a coin. And of course, I mean, implicit in all that was that the coin is, had, had a fixed probability, which is one half when the coin is fair of, of, of doing this. So I have a fixed coin that is not changing. So the probability distribution, to talk technically, is fixed. And it is producing the randomness of ones and zeros, which is already, as I said, contains in it all, all the full power of probability theory. And it requires, and it requires already all the um, uh, in, infinities of um, all the infinities of reasoning at, at, uh, with the sample space and the, and, and the set theory. But the major thing is that the randomness was very benign, was very simple. It was the randomness of a coin. Now try to imagine for one second that the probability distribution or the mass distribution in the coin, which makes it tilt to one side or the other one, you try to think that that is random. So when the coin is in the air, there is some other random device that tells me whether the weight of the coin is going to tilt to that side and that side. So it's as if you are flipping another coin to determine whether the coin is going to be loaded to heads or tails. And now tell me what happens. Now, of course, you will observe ones and zeros also, heads or tails, but there is no way you could explain that with only one dimension of randomness as, as, as before, which, was, which is the unloaded coin or the coin which is not drawn randomly. Now, that situation where the probability distribution or the mass distribution of the coin is drawn randomly can perfectly well be accommodated by probability theory. Probability theory is very powerful, as I said, because of the sample space. So now we enter a new dimension in the sample space by saying there are new samples which are how the probability distribution of the first coin is, be is being said, and there is no limit. You can imagine also that as you draw the coin, not only the probability distribution of it changes randomly, but the surface of the tables you are on a ship and then the waves makes it so and so. There is no limit to that. And probability theory, thanks to Golmogorov, is infinitely rich in terms of uh, nesting all those uh, random effects one after the other. In my field of finance, we are definitely dealing with probability distribution that are far, far, far more sophisticated in terms of nesting than flipping a coin. Why? Because as I said yesterday, and even briefly to, uh, to this morning, if I'm flipping a coin uh, for the stock, deciding every time whether the stock goes up or down with a fixed coin, this, in terms of Brownian motion, will translate immediately in volatility, to speak the financial uh, thing, is constant. So volatility is a constant, let's say, 20%. But we know that it's not constant because volatility itself is changing stochastically. So therefore, to explain in finance the fact that derivatives show instantly such shapes which are not flat, because if all the option prices were aligned on the same flat surface, in that case, volatility would be constant. And in that case, I would be only flipping a coin to determine the trajectory of the underlying equity. To explain the fact that, in effect, you have such shapes in the derivatives, you have to say that the probability distribution is much more complex than flipping a coin. So it's flipping a coin whose distribution is being flipped also, so the volatility is stochastic, in other words, etc., etc., etc. And I end up in the algorithms that we currently have with a situation where I have five levels of different volatilities to explain all that. Not to mention that other effects can also enter into the picture, where, for instance, if I'm flipping uh, a coin, all of a sudden, by flipping another coin, I can decide that I'm no longer flipping a coin, but a dice. So you can change even the device and jump to a whole new device. That also can be decided uh, randomly. So just to give you an idea of the sheer, sheer complexities of the distribution, nevertheless, all of that is still manageable, as I said, by probability theory, because I can go as deeply as I want in the complexity of the, of the, of the sample space. But still, I'm not happy, even though all the algorithms that we devise in my company are based on probability theory and are based on 
probability distributions, which are complex, of course, but still there are probability distributions. I'm not happy because the market to me is something always in excess of the given instance of the algorithm, no matter how, how many layers I have in it. The market is, by definition, the fact that if I have a certain instance of nesting of, of, of probabilities, that will give me the value of some derivative, but the market will change that value into a price, therefore will diverge from it, therefore, at, if I now reason at infinity myself, the market to me is a condition whereby no fixed level of randomness will cover the market. So there is, there, there is no limit to the nesting. So it's as if the market is already going to the infinite depths of the sample space, except that all I'm saying is that I put it forward instead of, of backwards. So that is absolute randomness in the sense that there is no level at which I can stop and claim that I have captured the market. So there is no algorithmic trading, no matter how layered it is that can capture the market, because the market of derivatives, keeping in mind that the market of derivatives is simple, not complex, because every time a derivative, no matter how complex it is, trades, it becomes a simple asset on which you can trade another derivative. So it's always going back down. So in that sense, the market, to me, expresses something that is, I'm still searching it, but to me has to be a concept more powerful than randomness in the sense of uh, probability theory. And this is what I can call absolute contingency or absolute randomness, I mean, to, 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 to speak another word, uh, uh, something that has no other representation than itself. And then the fact that you are always working between level n and n plus one. So, so that, that, is, that is the thing. So I can deliver a technology, but always a technology that is, has no structure, that is ready to morph into the n plus one uh, structure. So that's how we connect back to the fact there is in the technology that we have developed no pre-specific uh, structure. The technology should be able to take into account any new uh, addition. question just in terms of the broader framework or remit of our project which is thinking about the question of ethics and I'm wondering with what you're saying is there any role whatsoever for reflecting on questions of ethics with with this description that you've given us mm -hmm. yeah I mean the, the main question that I keep uh, encountering is whether derivatives are good or bad I mean to, to go back to the basic question of, of ethics uh, there are, I distinguish between two derivatives. The, 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 definitely the derivatives that are too complex, like the, the subprime uh, derivatives, the CDOs, are so complex that you cannot trade them on the market. It's only banks that value them with some very obscure uh, models and actually failed. So these are bad derivatives because they are so complex that you cannot build a robust enough algorithm to price them, offer their prices to the market, and what is key in my whole uh, research and philosophy is that the next instant, because the market is going to go against the prediction of your algorithm, the algorithm should be able to recalibrate itself in order to still be in the market. So the fact that you are able to recalibrate the algorithm is the key thing, so to, uh, to be a little bit technical. To be able to do that, you ha the derivatives have to have to be simple. So simple, like those ones that are traded in Chicago by traders, as I used to be, which are calls and puts, like the, what we call vanilla options, or slight variations of those. These are good derivatives because they are simply uh, described and they trade very liquidly. And their market is so liquid that it allows me to recalibrate my model every day. So these are good derivatives. The bad derivative is the one that is so complex that only a huge black box, which is completely based on probability theory, by the way. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's also covered by Kolmogorov, etc., except that there is a huge complexity in terms of the matrices of correlation between things, etc. So this thing produces a number for the bank that started selling the CDOs, except that the formulas were so complex 
that it dependent, it was fragile in the sense, so it dependent on an assumption that as soon as that assumption was uh, invalidated, meaning the whole assumption on the credit crisis was that there is no way that everyone will go bankrupt together when you are like loaning money to people with no income and you're bundling them into CDOs. The assumption was that statistically uh, there is not a chance that the hundred households that are bundled in your subprime bond will go bankrupt at the same moment. But this is exactly what happened. So you became completely fragile with respect to a very sophisticated assumption in the correlation matrix that you have. And in the meantime, you had no sanity check with the market every day because the stuff was not traded openly in the market, was just traded more in a speculative bubbles than anything else by banks producing these things and making money all the way up in the speculative bubble. So to me, to go back to ethics, derivatives are very good as soon as you can trade them in a market liquidly. So therefore, they have to be simple enough. And they're even very good because, as I said, the randomness that we are facing in the economy or to put it another way, the absolute randomness, which is the future that we are looking at, because the future is there. I mean, is there. You cannot not have a future. And you cannot not have a future that is completely contingent. Therefore, you require, according to me, a stock exchange for that. And you require all the power of derivatives, which are traded on the same stock exchange, not traded in the black boxes of banks, because this I don't call trading. So that is good. That is good in the sense that it's, it's as if I mean, we have a technology which is good because it's giving us insights and uh, ways into the future that uh, we, don't, we wouldn't have had otherwise. So, can I, can I just, just to clarify, yeah, because sure. this is a, a sort of a foreign universe in, in many respects for me. So, on the one hand, you're saying what's essential is that algorithms need to be, to, to be able to recalibrate yes. or be responsive to changing conditions. Yeah, it's the same. And, so the kind of, and the sorts of assumptions that were made created a situation of fragility where that responsiveness wasn't possible any longer. Yeah. So I'm sort of thinking about not principles, but but ways of, of offering an ethical framework in terms of markets. And then, and then the second part seems to be something around this question of transparency of exchange. Yes. On the market, rather than this is the black box. Yeah, yeah. So these, these, in yeah. these instances, it's very transparent because it's a, it's a, it's a listed market, so it's open. Uh, it's an open market, so it's completely uh, transparent. And uh, one ethical rule that uh, traders have, and this is maybe the ethical rule that I should, uh, that I might uh, draw from the market, is to take the loss. If you are trading as a, as a human being, not as a machine. And I do insist in all my thinking and philosophy that the market can only be down to human agents and you cannot be put in the hands of machine if only because the complexity of derivatives makes the machines fail anyway. The one ethical uh, imperative that a trader should have is to be able to remain afloat and alive in the market forever. And for that to be possible, he has to cut a losing position. You cannot accumulate a loss. Because if you accumulate a loss, the next day you won't be able to trade and come back to the market. If, if you have a loss, you, what, what does it mean? It means if you, if you are owning a stock and the stock is going down, you have, you don't ha you have to, to sell it at a loss, lose money. Why? To be able to come back on the floor the next day and do some trading and make some money back as a market maker. Because the market maker makes money all the time by sa selling and buying to various people. Of course, he can incur losses because the market is moving in random direction. But the, the first ethical rule is to be able to always mark your positions to the market. Don't hide from the fact that the market has moved against you. This is what happened to a lot of banks that hid from the fact that uh, the portfolios of CDOs that they have no longer make sense in terms of reselling value. So if you are a market maker on the liquid market, you cannot hide from the fact that the market went against you. You have every time at the end of the day to mark your positions uh, in accountancy to the market and take the loss when you have in order to be able to be in the market again. According to me, it's because the big banks that were involved in the subprime crisis did not take the loss but were bailed out by, by various people or by governments that the crisis was not ethically <laughs> resolved or not even uh, 
uh, resolved. And I think that's, that's uh, I mean, if you, that's an ethical rule, I think. I think the market is good in that sense in putting in the minds of people the fact that so someone has to recognize his mistakes, as simple as that, and in order, if only to be able to, to carry on the next day. So I would just like to ask what I find remarkable yesterday when we were talking is the derivative market is based on looking at the contingency of the future. Right? So yes. it's about the future. Then another interesting part is that, for instance, with big data and so on, it's a kind of looking at the past. Yeah, so statistics, I mean, in a sense. Statistics. So, what, what do you think? How to, is there a way to, to make them talk? Because if one can look only in the future, the other one can look only in, in the past. And then the, the figure of Pierre Menard, I think it's an interesting figure because somehow he's trying to work with both in a way. So my, my question would be, do you see your derivative objects comfortable in the world of data or do you think they are trying to step out of it? Uh, I mean, I... I'm open to change, of course, but I always tend to think that, no, the two worlds are incompatible. So I'm completely against uh, statistics, uh, completely against big data in the sense uh, that uh, the, the, the there is a big temptation in, in, in big data. It's, it's that the, the data is there. Mm -hmm. So because it's there, as Luger was saying yesterday, and so massive, you cannot stop people from running al statistical algorithms on it. I mean, if I had a company, I would maybe invest in doing so because Okay, I mean, you have, to, you, you have to do something with the data. But however, I, I call it a, a, a temptation, of course, which is very hard to resist, but also a danger, because as you are saying, you can only run statistical algorithms, which are only so simple, and anything can, can, come up, can, can, can come up out of that. When the data is sufficiently uh, big, any kind of statistical rule can emerge which can be completely wrong and uh, potentially generate disasters. So that's because you are talking at a huge amount of unstructured data that makes no sense apart from the fact that it is huge. Whereas in derivatives, it's not chaos because the derivatives are structured. The derivatives, you know exactly what the call and the put are. They have strikes, they have maturities. And if only you want to apply financial theory to that and make sure that the prices that a market maker is producing are arbitrage free, meaning I don't want to produce 1200 prices like I'm doing here and offer somebody the opportunity to make money out of me immediately. That's called an arbitrage. As soon as you impose that constraint, you can no longer do anything. You can no longer do statistical data. I cannot run a statistical algorithm on derivatives, just let the algorithm learn through the trading history of those 1200 options what the next price is going to be. Why? Because instantly, regardless of history, I have to always ensure something which is called the non-arbitrage, which imposes mathematical constraints on the prices of the algorithm, which are highly non-trivial. So that's why the algorithms that we have do only that. They are very complicated, but the only purpose of the algorithm is to find the probability distribution very sophisticated in terms of Kolmogorov, etc., that makes sure that all those prices are arbitrage free. This is exactly the purpose of the exercise. But this in itself imposes a different, completely different nature of a constraint than statistically learning from a completely, you know, messy uh, amount of data and uh, building a rule of action. I, I, again, I could throw that into a big data uh, number cruncher and tell him, please uh, figure for me a trading strategy on option. But chances are, even though that strategy might succeed for some, some amount of time because it has learned something by new neural network or whatever, definitely it's not correct because if it, if it doesn't have wired in it the constraint of applying the principle of non-arbitrage, <coughs> then it will fail, if not 
uh, in actual history, at least it fails logically because it means that somebody who, would, who is aware of that algorithm can definitely tailor make a derivative which will make that uh, trading strategy uh, fail. Uh, so that's why in finance, because finance is looking forward, because derivatives are all about future payouts of money that I get in the future, that I have in my algorithm to project the time ahead and figure out this constraint of arbitrage and I cannot end up with something that looks as a learning mechanism for a statistical algorithm. I have to apply uh, derivative pricing theory. Okay, I agree with you. You both don't like uh, statistics. <laughs> because I agree uh, that it's completely inadequate. So what uh, you present is with the derivative, uh, deri derivatives and so on, in my understanding, is uh, stochastics. Yes. This is the French way and, uh, of, of thinking in this way, or the uh, history with the moving and you know, all these yeah. things. Yeah. So I understand that and I think this is appropriate. So, but I like machine learning because I think it's not about statistics. Of course, uh, <coughs> uh, big data uh, normally is uh, is uh, sorry, 95 percent of the of the way it's it's used simply says that we have massive data. So it's a lot of data, and then you make statistics on, on, on top of that. So, but I think the nature of big data is the principal connectivity of anything. Mm -hmm. So then we are, I think, in <coughs> uh, towards uh, uh, quantum. So then I completely disagree that. Big data is looking backwards and stochastics is looking uh, uh, forward. forward. No, I think you are within the data and uh, with big data. You are within. So I need a, so it's like a, like a wheel. So it's paradox. If you're not, not ahead and you're not back, you're within. So and it's like in mechanics, you're with the rotating wheel. So the invention of the wheel. Mm -hmm. So something which is moving infinitely and fixed and stable in, in its center. So this is what I, I, I meant. So, and I think with uh, machine learning, you are with these wheels. So you have a center and you are within the stream of things, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And by that, it's an abstraction of stochastics and statistics, I think. And this is what I would say uh, at the third time, and I know this is uh, nowhere like that. If you have statistics, we don't like that. It's, too, it's primitive and positivistic. <laughs> So we have <laughs> the yeah. prediction, we have the stochastics, and I would say probabilistic should be reserved for these kinds of quantum phenomena being within. So in this paradox situation that you can't decide whether it's back or forth and so on. And I would uh, strongly um, <coughs> uh, uh, argue towards that with big data, independent of that 95% is, is de facto relatively simple and stupid, but the kernel of that and the principal potential of that is a quantum phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And this is a, like the spinning wheel. So running all the stuff, you're within and you're stable at the axis of this wheel. So and uh, this is what I would say is probabilistic. So and then I don't agree with these lines of, uh, of Van Mises and with uh, Mogorov and so I'm not pretty sure what it is, <coughs> but this kind of axiomatization of stochastical things, I think they are strongly in, <coughs> in, 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 uh, in contrast to what I think in quantum mechanics and so on that is working on. Yeah, so what I, for example, mm. know with Feynman with the quantum electrodynamics and so on. No, but definitely the formalism of quantum mechanics, uh, it's true that I had not mentioned it, it's a completely uh, different to Kolmogorov. Yeah. Because okay. it makes the experiment so depend on context. Data yeah. is, okay. Is, is, uh, is on this line on uh, yeah. mechanics, and I would think so. This is what I think. You have this English tradition of statistics with uh, Bayes. You have uh, Bernoulli and so on. This French thing on the stochastic, and I would reserve this uh, this concept of probability, not mixing it up with these two, but just for this quantum uh, stuff. And I would put that. <coughs> Big data and I mean, I came across. Uh, yeah. Sorry, 
Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I did not have the time, even though I had a slide for it. I mean, to me, the kind, ultimately, the kind of uh, probability that I'm looking at, which is beyond Kolmogorov, so it's meta-probabilistic in the sense, because as I said, I want always to be able to recalibrate my model. Therefore, I always want yeah. to be able to look at the model from above. So as soon as it is meta-probabilistic, it connects more to quantum mechanics and to the wave uh, uh, vector being a meta-probabilistic tool rather than yeah, a, a probabilistic the tool. The with, yeah. with, with the quantum is that you even don't think about any model at all. So it's, it's no need for, this is what I yesterday showed with these lines of simple events. So yeah. you have simply events and you abstract from any kind of model. Any kind of structure. Any kind of prediction and so on. So yeah. you simply don't care what it is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I came across a book recently, which really was also, I mean, exactly the book that I needed at that time, uh, written by Krenikov, and it's called The Probability and Randomness, Classical and uh, Quantum. So he really goes to the depths of showing what is the limitation of Kolmogorov and what kind of other logics of, uh, of probability you may have. And of course, the next level, as we said, is the fact that always have multiple context, contexts that can uh, interact. But maybe what you said last, meaning what, that you have no structure uh, at any point and therefore criticizing uh, Kolmogorov and measure theory from that sense, maybe that could relate to also a book that was key in my, uh, in my readings uh, by uh, Schaffer and Wolfk, uh, who wrote a book which is called Probability uh, and, and Finance. And they completely come up with an alternative to the system of Kolmogorov where uh, what you are saying probably applies, meaning there is no structure, there is only data and I have to find my way inside it as a game yeah. that I'm playing with reality. Yeah. So it, it, I had a slide for it, but I did not have the time to show it. So here, the, the, uh, the assumption where you forget about uh, stochastics and stochasticity and the sample space and all that and turn over to the fact that the future and the present are all together in the data is what they call a game where reality, in a sense, is prepared to do any move against you to ultimately not make you make money on the market. And they don't go into specifying exactly what the stochastic structure is. Yeah, yeah so that might be... So therefore, I think this is a term we, we tried to point out uh, yesterday. So if you get this, uh, this kind of abstraction, if you get this, this running and you get this table point, this is somehow... It's a movement from this uh, global, general um, mapping of what is going on, mm -hmm. and finding truth in there, okay. just to put it in your pocket. So it gets personal. Uh -huh. So and, uh, this is how to ask questions. And then you have a personal view to all this stuff. And then you get a, a personal responsibility to all this stuff because you have it in the pocket. And uh, then another one is connected to all this stuff again, and he has another pocket because he's asking other, uh, other questions. And then I think we are persons again. This is what we have this privacy yesterday and so on. Just put it rotating in your pocket and you mm -hmm. have it. <laughs> and, <laughs> so don't trust on these, uh, so this was, uh, don't trust that there's a global truth of this stuff. So this is misunderstanding of big data. So and this is uh, the okay. rhetoric of Google and so on, that there's some truth in what's going on there. So okay. just put it in your pocket, let it rotate and, and, and do this, take your own spin with it. And this mm -hmm. I think is, I would be very interested, I, I don't know that, to, to, to discuss it in depth with, 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 with your domain and with, with your expertise. There. Yeah, I mean, maybe ultimately the question is because still in finance we still have institutions who are supposed to produce prices like market makers. Maybe if you're telling me there is no longer a single market maker, maybe a bank or a single person, that's supposed to quote for me 1,200 prices and every price can be quoted by a different individual, maybe it will work somehow without there being any unifying structure, maybe. But unfortunately, up to, the, up to now, I mean, um, uh, people are still looking at a market maker for the options on the S&P. So therefore, I have to have, even though the model is going to be completely destroyed the next second, but instantly I have to have some uh, stochastics yeah, in, in the picture uh, to be able to, be, to verify non-arbitrage. Yeah, Different than the statistics, but the stochastic structure, structure needs to be this uh, generic infrastructure and has to be solid. Otherwise, nothing is working. Uh -huh. Like, I can't use my mobile phone if the infrastructure is not working. So, it simply has to work, uh, the GSM. Otherwise, it's not working. It's the same here. This, uh, so, in my intuition, the stochastic infrastructure 
has to be solved. Otherwise, okay. uh, you are done. Yeah. Because uh, there's no material you can work on. Yeah, in my, case, in my case, it amounts to saying that the market should be there, yes. uh, no matter what. Absolutely. Yes. Which ultimately is, to me, the ultimate uh, computing engine. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can connect to that. I don't know if even play any role in yeah. thinking, but I am coming from literature theory, and very much, um, uh, and very, very, very much thinking for a long time, of course, about these questions now, like Maurice Broncho, the, uh, the book, the coming book, the book to come. come. So there is a, a dimension to, I find this idea of um, thinking about the notion of Christ as a kind of writing extremely exciting, mm -hmm. because it Promise, there is a promise in it for me to, re to relate numbers calculation with, with writing, with articulation, with interpretation and so on, with subjectivity, and with, all, with, with the whole hermeneutics voiced space that we know from the legacy of the books. But I have one problem that I cannot find a way out um, with, with the proposal. You started in the beginning by saying what is crucial for your way of thinking about the market is that price is primary and value doesn't exist. Doesn't exist, and then comes into existence from the kind of trading um, uh, a history, well, establishing a history, and then the idea with Pierre Menard that it's like how can you how can you be active at trying to establish a history without wanting to intentionally do it, so change it, so in. No, so there is a, a kind of, a, of an anonymity mm -hmm. to the figure of Pierre Menard and he's trying to rewrite to write. Don Quixote, well, not, to write, not, exactly, not really. <laughs> to write, but then the book, so the objectivity of the text which is there and the authority, now the authorship behind it which goes away and yet it's a kind of a way of, 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 of reclaiming like an, one singular case of an anonymous voice, something like this. And this is, this is very, very interesting, I think. With regards to exactly your question, I think, so is there, I wouldn't ask, is there an ethical framework or rules that we can now translate mm -hmm. and bring to other fields, mm -hmm. but the very way of thinking, the way you do, for me, I, as I understand, is an ethical way of engaging with mm -hmm. the problems that are at stake. Okay. But what I, what I cannot buy is that price is primary, because what does that mean? <laughs> if price is primary, it means, it's the, I mean, to put it very drastically, and I'm not at all wanting to say that this is how you are thinking of it, but if we look at it in this legacy of Maurice Blanchot and the book to come, then of course what is at stake is the role of writing in the scriptures uh, and, and in the whole legacy of, um, of, of Christianity. <laughs> and, and there, if you, if you take it literally, what you have is these books were testaments, so last wills. Mm -hmm. And on that level, what you are saying, with the market is the medium of contingency. It is becoming a last will as well. Mm -hmm. If you think, if you set it absolute. Yeah, I say it's a book even. It's market. even a book, yes. no? It is a test, it is the last will, it is a testament and it is a book. But then what does it mean that we are writing prices? <laughs> because if it is a book, then there is something to be witnessed. Yeah, to me the market is so always in the middle of the event. So it's all, almost a book of the end of times. <coughs> So it's a record exactly. of the end of the But, it's, it's but it's, it's there every, every day, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but however, the apocalypse changes every day, you see, you see what I mean? So that's... Yeah, yeah, but still, I mean, it's, yeah, 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 of course. But it's a, it's a very, to translate it, more, I know, to, to detach it from some, from a, is it, is it a, a true way so of to, thinking to me, or a false yeah. way? It is one which has enormous implications to how we uh, relate to the world, and so what we do, whether we can be happy, but so all these kinds of things. It, so if we, if we really spell it out in this dimension, then it's, um, it's a very tragic, it's a very, very tragic kind of basic sentiment. And I have difficulties, I find it very beautiful how consist, so how it is, how, how it is made up and, and all the, the points of, that seem to be driving you with this interest in the anonymous singularity, you know, the, the, the concrete which is the abstract, and that's why the concrete is the infinite, and the abstract which always finitizes, mm -hmm. but then at the same time we, we always relate to the abstract because it's a way to actually address the infinite, but of course it's not. <laughs> so all these kinds of, of, um, of lines, but this one point, it's like with, with Maya Su, I cannot, why, why do we need to say it's it, there's a necessity to contingency? Why can we not say there's contingency? 
and there is relative necessities, <coughs> contracts. That Michel said, that's my, my, my sympathy for Michel said, it's, a con it's not natural laws, there are contracts. Mm -hmm. Nature no, is contractual. So, so of course we have to think and to consider regularity, repetition, prediction, but why are we trying to finish them? Why is it necessary to say the necessity of contingency? No, I mean, may, may I sue, uh, I mean, he was misinterpreted by, by many people who thought that he was saying that everything goes and therefore there is no, total no, chaos, etc. Yeah. No, but he's trying to, I, I think, trying, and I think he even told this to me privately, what he was trying to say is to, com to completely follow a very rigorous yeah. philosophical argument by saying, if thought has to uh, abide by the principle of philosophy, which is that thought has to think necessary things, because philosophy is not thinking thoughts that are laws of thoughts, new laws of thoughts, even though philosophy keep, keeps discovering new <coughs> laws of thoughts, of course, and maybe two philosophers can never discuss together, etc. But there is, there is the ambition of discovering systems or laws of thoughts. So uh, Meyesu was led to the idea that if he follows the argument that what is the thing, thing that thought can think necessarily, turns out to be contingency, <coughs> according to him. So, so, so uh, on the contrary, you can read Meyasu as following a very strict program. It's not anything goes. On the contrary, he is really trying to go to the limit of what thought, in the sense of uh, the imperative of thinking, and so constraints you put on it, it ends up uh, to be contingency. But if I read you like this, then yeah. it's not philosophy. It's a thought experiment. It's a kind of a technical artifact. Yeah. It's a kind of a technical artifact, which is yeah. beautiful. It's like, a, it's like a statue, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I might agree with you here because I like artifacts, so I like yeah, that. I mean, the, re the but reason... Then I want to speak of it as a mechanic and not yeah. as a philosopher. And that's a problem because then saying necessity... Of yeah, the maybe. So even in my case, I mean, the reason why I'm still exploring the market, it's because it amuses me. It amuses me <laughs> to get as far as I can in the <laughs> metaphysics yeah. and to get as far as I can with weird conclusions before I go back to the whole world and try to build, you know, a, an acceptable or ethical uh, position, etc. I think I'm not done yet with the metaphysics, uh, so speaking of apocalypse, etc. So, for instance, one of the things that I like to draw from all this is to say, well, everybody tells me that the event is completely unpredictable. It's only after the event happens that I can know what the event is by definition. So, you have always to be exposed to the event to know what the event is. This is a triviality. So, Therefore, one of my points is try to say, in the market, as far as the market is concerned, I'm not trying to draw conclusions uh, everywhere, it's as if you are in the middle of the event, exposed of the event, yet you have solved the time paradox, which is, you are in the event in terms of the massivity and the logic of the event, but yet you are chronologically before the event, in a way. So that's why it becomes a way of really dealing with the event, with the massiveness that it deserves. Uh, but I agree with you that I'm still experimenting with artifacts or combinations or amusing artifacts combinations uh, of, of, th yeah, of, of thinking uh, and not yet, you know, uh, grown that into the ambition of... Uh, uh, and as you see, my, my, my trajectory, I'm even going deeper in the foundation of probability theory, so I'm going even deeper in the technical stuff instead, you know, <laughs> of uh, open up, uh, opening up the, the subject. But, um, yeah, that's why I can find it difficult <laughs> to express at times. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, I think we make lunch break. Yeah. So we can we continue. It's it's at twelve thirty-five. Is it? It's one and a half hours. Right? We continue at two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.